مساء الخير يعطيكم العافيه اليوم راح نحكي عن بيريكاريوسنتيسيز الكاريوسنتيسيز السهل الممتنع بالنسبه للكاريوري صراحه بالنسبه للتريتمنت وانا ام سينج ذات بيكوز ا لوت اوف تايمز وي انديوس ذات during our complex interventions and we have to be responsible about the complications that we induce. So we have to be proficient in the management of patients who develop pericardial effusion, particularly pericardial tamponade, whether it is related to electrophysiology studies, and I see some faces here, or related to complex interventions, particularly as we mentioned last uh, month about uh, rotational atherectomy and complex angioplasty, or sometimes even vascular intervention SVC intervention, or it, during aortic intervention, sometimes you end up with pericardial diffusion. And the issue here I'm going to talk about is some historical background. In the awal marra can we mention about pericardial synthesis? The first description of cardiac decompression was in 1653. So we have 400 plus years concept of pericardial decompression. Riolonas uh, suggested uh, sternal trephination to relieve the pericardial effusion. Carefully trephine. It's the same concept they used it for relieving subdural hematomas. So he suggested that could be the concept to relieve pericardial compression because of collection of now this concept evolved uh, about 100 years ago into what we call uh, the sub approach for pericardiosynthesis, which is the blind pericardiosynthesis. And this was suggested by Marfan, <laughs> and uh, the procedure continued for decades, till the 70s in fact, despite very high morbidity and mortality. Morbidity is in the range of 50% and mortality in the range of 6%. So it's really a very primitive uh, technique, I think, to do the blind pericardiosynthesis. However, in subsequent years, safer and more successful techniques were introduced, and particularly the introduction of fluoroscopic, electrocardiographic, and lately, echocardiographic guidance, and with different approaches. The only approach was sub -xiphoid, and we will talk about different approaches, and the different guided techniques which uh, so far, I do all of my pericardiosynthesis, whether they are acute or chronic, small, large, or whatever, under guidance with echocardiography and sometimes with fluoroscopy. And let's talk about the blind pericardiosynthesis, which was introduced in 1911 by Marfan. You place the patient in a supine or semi-reclining position as tolerated. Now, you percutaneous between the sub -xiphoid and the left sternal border and then again between 30 to 45 degrees and towards the left shoulder. Now you advance under negative pressure until there is aspiration of pericardial fluid. When you aspirate, you introduce a J-tipped wire through the needle into the pericardial space and advance big tail catheter. The problem is it's blind. You could enter the right ventricle. You could enter the right atrium instead of the pericardium. So if the fluid is bloody, as we sometimes say, face it with the complication of procedures, uh, you are in a bind. There's no really guidance. What it, if it is not bloody solution, whether it is from the peritoneum, whether it is from the pericardium or the, the pleural space, it's not a big deal. But sometimes it is uh, truly traumatic and uh, problematic. You aspirate the dry with continuous monitoring of vital signs. Now, the fluoroscopic guidance technique, which was the earlier version of guidance introduced, and the first imaging guided technique of percutaneous pericardiosynthesis, it is performed through sub xiphoid approach, similar to the blind technique. However, you have fluoroscopy to guide your wire. Now, the needle position in the pericardial space is confirmed by contrast agent injection. When you aspirate, you inject a little bit of contrast, and you can demonstrate whether the contrast goes into the RV or the RA, or if it is sluggish layering of the contrast medium inferiorly, it indicates a correct position. 
So it is still, to me, I think this is primitive technique of fluoroscopic guidance, and uh, you can do it that way. But then you introduce the shape guide wire, and introduce it to the position and confirm by at least two angiographic projection, AP and lateral, to confirm that it is around the heart rather than inside the chambers of the heart. And the major disadvantages include the need for esterization laboratories, exposure to radiation for the patient and physician, and an echocardiographic examination to assess the distribution and amount of pericardial fluid should always precede fluoroscopic guided procedure. So this is pure chloroscopic, but it has to be preceded by echo to know where is your fluid. Now this is the fluoroscopic evidence that the guide wire is in the pericardial space. Now it goes into the RV and the pulmonary space, you have to be aware of that sometimes. It, it certainly go into the right ventricle. Now the echo guided technique, I think it is the safest and the simplest technique of pericardial synthesis. It can be done in the cath lab, it can be done at the bedside, it can be done anywhere. And it is very simple, and I think we have very few uh, steps that we have to follow up. Now, the echo guided pericardiosynthesis is the simple and the safest technique. It was introduced by Nye Clinic in 1979 and widely used nowadays. I started echo guided pericardiosynthesis in 1994, and I so far over the past 20 plus years, I only did blinded pericardial synthesis once in a patient who was crashing. We suspected that the patient had pericardial synthesis and we went to blind because there was no time. It was in, not in the cath lab. But since then, all pericardial synthesis I performed, it is equal guided. Now it follows, it allows the defi defi defining the position of the effusion, the ideal entry site, and the needed trajectory angulation of the needle where you want to go. So you can predict and the depth of, of the needle that you want to go through. There are two different approaches of eco-guided. The first approach, which is called the eco-assisted, uh, which is described by Mayo Clinic, you image where you want to enter, you remember the position and trajectory, and then you go with the needle as your memory allows that. Now, the eco-guided, truly eco-guided, we have the needle carrier mounted on the ultrasound, and you transduce, the transducer it advances the needle while active and continuous live imaging by echocardiography. And this is, you need a needle holder that it is applied the head of the transducer. We don't have it, we still use the eco assessment which is truly amazing and adequate at this time. But I'll talk about both of them. Now the eco-guided, you can do the approaches sub -Z forward If the maximum fluid is seen through the sub -Z forward you can do it through the apical approach, or you can do it through the parastemal approach. And I will talk about the three different approaches. So the approaches, <coughs> three different approaches by eco-guided technique. Now the sub xiphoid approach, the same thing. Insert the needle between the sub sternum and left costal margin. Once beneath the cartilage, lower the needle to about 30 degree angle with the skin towards the left shoulder. The major disadvantages, you need a longer needle. We sometimes need a spinal needle to do that. May transverse the left liver lobe and you can cause injury to the liver lobe. It is a steeper angle, you may enter the peritoneal cavity damage. Medi medial direction, you can enter the right atrium puncture, and that it is also not to and sometimes can lead to traumatic right atrial uh, problems. Now the advantages, definitely the sub xiphoid approach is the lowest risk of pneumothorax. But look at the disadvantages, they are numerous. The apical approach, the needle insertion is one to two centimeter lateral to the apex within the fifth to the seventh intercostal space. Also is guided by echo because sometimes the maximum depth of the fusion is seen through the apical approach. And you are directed by echo and you go through the apex. Sometimes the maximum depth of the pericardial fusion is through the sub approach. And you still use it echo guided but through the sub approach. 
but 90% of the approach that I use is parastatal, direct parastatal approach, which I'll talk to you in a minute. Now, advance the needle over the superior border of the rib, because if you go through the inferior border, there is a intercostal vascular structure and nerves, and you may injure them. So you always advance your needle on the superior border of the rib. Disadvantages, you can cause a ventricular puncture, you can increase the risk of pneumothorax because the lateral you are very close to the lung. Major advantages, thicker left ventricular wall is more likely to help heal after the puncture. Even if you puncture through the left ventricle, it's not a big deal. You just take out your needle and it will heal a lot, unless there is a big scar there. But it's not a big deal. The problem is the pneumothorax. It is the shorter approach in the to the bricardial space. Now the parasternal approach, which is in fact, 90% of echo-guided pericardiosynthesis is done through parastatal approach. This is the way to do it. Insert the needle between the fourth and fifth intercostal space at the edge of the sternal margin. Don't go to one. One centimeter lateral to the sternal margin. And you have to demonstrate that by echo, you have at least four to five millimeter thickness of the pericardial space, which is a critical when you have a patient in the cath lab and you induce the pericardial tamponade because you don't need a lot of volume to induce hypotension because it is acute development of tamponade and the amount of fluid could be not more than 100, 150 cc. So if I have at least four to five millimeter of pericardial space, I can get it by pericardial synthesis, eco-guided through the parastatic approach. So this is, you insert it, just lateral to the sternal margin, you advance the needle the same thing under negative pressure over the superior border of the rib. The same thing to avoid injuring the intercostal vessels and the nerves. The disadvantages, you can cause pneumothorax and you can puncture the internal thoracic vessels if you go too lateral. So this is the idea between one to two centimeters lateral to the edge, more than that you may enter the mammary artery or the thoracic arteries. So you have to be very careful to be punctured very close to the margin. Now the advantages, it is the shortest and the most direct up pathway. It is just beneath you. You can go into that, particularly in obese patients, you have a direct access to that. Our approach, this is our approach that we use it over the last 20 plus years. <laughs> you place the patient in the spine or semi reclining position as tolerated patient tolerates supine is better than the reclining position because you want the effusion to be anterior. Now bedside echocardiography, you identify the best approach, whether it is parasternal, apical, or subxiphoid by the depth of the pericardial space and the trajectory, the angle you want to use, and the depth. So you identify these by the, by the echo. You want to go deep five centimeters. You want to go angle by 20 degrees or 45 degrees or whatever. This is the echo probe can identify that for you. Now you mask, you, you mark the skin where you want to go into that. Then you do your scrub of the chest wall and give local anesthesia, advance the needle as described over the superior edge of the rib, if it is parasternal or apical approach or 30 degrees with the skin if it is subxiphoid approach until you aspirate the fluid in the absence of arrhythmias. Now when you aspirate the fluid which is not blood, it's not a big deal. You are comfortable, you can aspirate as much as you can, you can repeat the echo, see your aspiration and decreasing the amount. The problem when you have blood in the needle, which is most of the time what we have as a complication of pericardial uh, tamponade related to our procedures. In this case, you have to perform a bubble study to confirm your position that you are in the pericardial space, not in the RV and the RA. And I'll show you one example of that. This is the needle. And once you aspirate, you have agitated saline into the needle and you confirm that your position into the pericardial space. This is the step before you proceed further in case you have a blood. If you don't have a blood, it's not necessary. It's better to do it, but it's not necessary. So this is your aspirate, it's a bloody solution. You just confirm it by injection of agitated saline. And this, you are 
100% in the regarded space and not in the RV or the RA or somewhere else. Now you continue with that, you introduce a J guide wire of the six French sheets. You don't need no big, ta big tail, no catheters, nothing. Just introduce a sheath into the pericardial space. And you introduce the sheath and remove the dilator. So you end up with a sheath and a wire. Don't remove the wire. If you remove the wire, you spray 20, 50 cc's and it will be clogged because there will be suction at the tip of the, cat of the sheath and you will not be able to aspirate. The, the wire is to guarantee that you will have access to the pericardial space and you will not be sucked, sucked by the tissues in the pericardial area. So you keep your wire inside and you aspirate as much as you want till it is dry. Now, you aspirate till dry and the hemodynamics allows because sometimes when you aspirate very fast, there will be hypotension. Be careful of that. It is a real complication, but you have to be careful. At the end of the procedure, when you start having no aspiration, pull back your sheet up and down to, to allow more aspiration. And this is sometimes we aspirate a little bit more till the pericardial space is completely dry. You can confirm reduction and resolution of effusion by the echo. In case you have a large residual posterior effusion that you cannot get access with a short uh, six French sheath, you allow you put a long wire and advance a long sheath, 21 centimeter. It will go around the heart. <coughs> it's the same thing. You keep your wire inside, so it allows easy access to the pericardial uh, space. And then you aspirate more in case you have a large posterior pericardial effusion using the long sheath. Now this is your own the sheath while aspirating because you don't want to introduce any air into the pericardium or in selected cases that you have difficulty drying the pericardium, you connect the sheath to passive drainage overnight. 95% of our pericardial synthesis we remove the sheath right away because we can get back to it in case we have at least 45 millimeter again of collection. So this is, you don't have to leave it for a long period of time unless there is a difficulty drying it and the patient continues to bleed, particularly in bloody uh, pericardium. Now these are some pictures. This is the semi reclining position. This is the eco guided. You have a head of the, uh, the uh, imaging uh, transducer of the eco. And there is a device that you can angulate as much as you can, and you can determine the depth between the surface and the tip of the needle. These are the angles that give you four centimeter, five centimeter, 10 centimeter, whatever you want, and you can change the direction. We don't use this, it is very expensive. So this is just in case you want to be there. And while you are entering the pericardium, you can use the eco-guided, and this is the tip of the needle, start entering the pericardium, and once you introduce, you aspirate a fluid, you introduce your wire, and this is where the wire is. You can see it live, that it is entering the pericardium, and you can confirm by bulk study if you want or not. And then after you introduce your wire, just introduce your sheath. Don't use big tail. Big tail is a mess. That doesn't allow you to any advantages, more than just putting a sheath with the wire inside and you can aspirate as much as you want. <laughs> now this is one of the cases that we had induced or complicated uh, case with uh, perforation and up with the pericardial tamponade and this is the sheet. It's just only the sheet. We did not use big tail, we did not use uh, any other than that. And this is in fact we left it overnight because there was a little bit of leak that continued. The next day we imaged the patient patient had no pericardial collection whatsoever, we removed it. But I have mentioned, 95% of the cases, you can remove it right away. Should I finish it if... Okay, thank you.